Hey everyone and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast where we seek to develop, inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now here's what we've got for you today. On March 28, 1994, a landmark fire occurred in Lower Manhattan. This fire was one of the more heart-wrenching events in living memory. It led to the New York City Fire Department changing its protective gear. Firefighters would begin being outfitted with bunker gear starting May 16, 1994. The fire will forever be known in the annals of FDNY as the Watt Street Fire. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress, and we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative waterproof breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide gore-tex going further together the night tour began on march 28 1994 in routine fashion the apparatus masks radios and tools were being checked at approximately 18 25 hours the occupant of the first floor apartment at 62 Watt Street left her apartment and went to work. She left a plastic garbage bag on the stove top in an attempt to keep her dog out of the garbage while she was at work. The pilot light for the stove top heated the plastic bag and refuse on top of the stove. It began to paralyze and gas off. The fire had started. So let's pause there now and talk about the construction. The building was a three-story multiple dwelling constructed of brick and wood joist. There was one apartment per floor. The dimensions were 20 feet by 46 feet. There was a rear fire escape on the fire building that had a gooseneck ladder that ascended the roof. There was a scuttle ladder from the top floor to the roof and there was a skylight over the stairway. There was a second skylight over the third floor bathroom. There was an open wooden stairway. Most wood lath and plaster had been removed and replaced with drywall in the building. The ceilings had been dropped from the original height of 9 foot 3 inches to 8 foot 4 inches. The fire apartment had energy efficient replacement windows which also had screens and steel bars. The second floor originally had two entrance doors to the apartment. Renovations to the second floor eliminated the rear apartment door. The area of the hallway on each of the three floors was reduced due to renovations. The only entrance door was in the front of the stairway. In the hallway of the second floor There was a box spring and a mattress near the front apartment entrance door, leaning against the banister. This storage of a mattress and a box spring would prove to be a factor in the incident. There was also a table in the hallway near the stairway leading to the third floor. The third floor apartment had two entrances off the hallway. In relation to the occupancy, it was residential. There was one apartment per floor with a basement apartment as well for a total of four apartments. An occupant of 60 Watt Street smelled smoke in his top floor apartment. He dialed 911 and reported the smoke condition. One minute later, Manhattan Fire Alarm Dispatchers transmitted Box 308 for a telephone alarm for a reported smoke condition on the top floor of 60 Watt Street. Engines 24, 55 and 7, including ladders 5 and 8 and Battalion 2 were all dispatched to the scene. In 1938, a second source reported a smoke condition in 64 Watt Street. At this time, FDNY units responded to the location of Box 308. They had to navigate their way through the heavy rush hour traffic. The first truck in attendance was Ladder 8 at 1939. This arrived at the corner of Watt Street and Varick Street. With the first FDNY unit to arrive at the box, Ladder 8 could not make the left turn onto Watt Street against the traffic. The firefighters from Ladder 8 dismounted their apparatus and proceeded on foot approximately 120 feet to the reported address. There was an odour of fire in the air. As Lieutenant Dockwell from Ladder 8 approached the scene, he saw light smoke coming from the first floor windows of number 62 Watt Street. He radioed his chauffeur to transmit a 1075. The time was 1940 now, and Rescue 1 and Battalion 6 would be dispatched. 
Ladder 5, Engine 55, Engine 24, and Engine 7 all arrived at 1940. Ladder 5's tiller-type apparatus, being driven by firefighter Chris War and tillerman Gerard Redmond, were able to maneuver the ladder truck into Watch Street from Varick Street and position the apparatus in front of 64 Watch Street. Engine 55 took a hydrant at the corner of Varick Street and Watch Street, and Engine 7 took hydrant on the corner of Watch Street and 6th Avenue. Engine 24 positioned their pumper behind Engine 55, and there was a hydrant opposite 62 Watch Street, but was inaccessible due to traffic conditions at this time. So just to recap on the apparatus and equipment, the original alarm assignment was at three engines, two ladders and a battalion chief. Ladder 5's apparatus was a tiller-type aerial apparatus, and Ladder 8's apparatus was a rear-mount-type aerial apparatus. Eventually, a second alarm would be transmitted, bringing a total of eight engines, four ladders, a rescue, three battalion chiefs, and a deputy chief. Today's podcast is powered by our partner Lifelines and their revolutionary approach to functional hydration. Just like in firefighting, water is essential for body function, but studies show more than 80% of firefighters are dehydrated. A 25-year study findings from the National Institute of Health showed poor hydration to be linked to early aging and chronic disease and even mild dehydration, results in significant negative impact outcomes including headaches, exhaustion, rapid pulse, irritability and poor cognitive function. A study conducted by Yale University showed that participants who were just 1% dehydrated had a 12% increase in errors when performing tasks that required cognitive flexibility. In addition, dehydration is shown to worsen mood and attitude, contribute to confusion and poor decision making and negatively affect memory and judgment. In other words, you really don't want your incident commander, firefighter, or for that matter, any first responder on a critical scene to be even slightly dehydrated. Mild dehydration occurs when a person is just 1.5% dehydrated, a condition that does not even trigger the first response in most people. So just imagine how quickly a firefighter or any first responder can and does become dehydrated in their day-to-day duties, which is why I address my hydration first thing every day with Lifelines. Go into the notes for this episode and specifically check out Lifelines Hydro Fuel and Hydro O OG by clicking in the notes for the podcast for a clean energy solution designed for those who demand more from their day. Now back to the show. Back on the incident ground, members of Engine 55 tested their hydrant and started their stretch of a one and three quarter inch hose line with a controlling nozzle. The fire building was 120 feet away from the corner of Watch Street and Varick Street, and members of Engine 7 came to Engine 55's apparatus to assist in the hose stretch. Ladder 8 arrived first and assumed the role of the first due ladder company. The outside vent firefighter from Ladder 8 entered 62 Watt Street, thinking this would be the way to get to the rear of the reported fire building. He saw smoke coming from the first floor apartment door of 62 Watt Street. The Ladder 8 vent firefighter started forcing entry to the first floor apartment. He was assisted by Ladder 8's forcible entry firefighter. The officer of Ladder 8 arrived on the first floor of fire apartment door. He told his firefighters, who were laboring trying to force the door open, the steel book door to use a rabbit tool to gain entry. Outside, firefighter Chris War of Ladder 5 raised their aerial ladder to the roof of Exposure 2, and Ladder 5's forcible entry team, Captain Dremon, Firefighter Seidberg, and Firefighter Young, would assume the second due to ladder company duties. Firefighter Craig Mahanan gained access to the roof by climbing to the roof of Exposure 4 and crossing over to the building's roof. Meanwhile, Ed Donahue from Ladder 5 would gain access to the roof off the building by climbing Ladder 5's aerial ladder and crossing over to the fire building in front of the building. Two minutes after the first vehicle arrived, Battalion Chief Richie Ardison of Battalion 2 arrived at the fire and assumed command. He heard a handy talkie transmission from Ladder 8's roof firefighter that the roof is open, the rear is clear, and the smoke coming out of the scuttle. One minute later, Ladder 5's forcible entry team of Captain Dremon and Seidberg, including Jimmy Young, entered the fire building. Captain Dremon stopped and told the officer of Ladder 8 that they were going above the fire. Engine 55 had now positioned their hose line near the fire apartment entrance. An excess hose was being flaked out in the street. However, their hose was still in charge at this time. And it's now about 1 hour and 17 minutes since the occupant of the apartment had left, leaving the garbage bag on top of the stove. Ladder 8's forcible entry team was finally able to force the door into the fire compartment. Initially, there was an outrush of heavy grey smoke, followed by a reversal of the smoke into the fire compartment. The lieutenant from Ladder 8, attempted entry into the fire apartment to perform a primary search, but was driven back by the extreme heat. Ladder H lieutenant ordered their ventilation firefighter to vent from the front windows of the fire apartment from the exterior. 
Battalion Chief Richie Ardison of Battalion 2 transmitted all hands and requested an additional engine and truck at 1943 hours. Engine 18 and Ladder 20 would then be dispatched. At 1944 hours, Battalion Chief Ardison, working exterior in charge of the incident, heard a muffled urgent urgent over the handy talkie. When he asked who gave the urgent, the reply was Ladder 5. The nozzle man of Engine 55, Firefighter Kev Erdman, went to the front door of the building to see what the delay was in getting water. Firefighters from Engine 7 and Engine 24 flaked out the excess hose in front of the fire building, and they then returned to Engine 55's apparatus to start stretching a second hose line. Water filled the first hose line, and Engine 55's members went to prepare and advance their hose line. Fire was now lapping out the upper reaches of the first floor apartment door and up the interior stairway. The fire now had a greater intensity. Following the request from the lieutenant firefighting internally, the outside vent firefighter from Ladder 8, now on the roof of the building, broke the front windows with the hook, and after just five seconds, a ball of fire erupted from the front windows, which lasted about 10 to 15 seconds. Firefighter Kevin Erdman, Engine 55's nozzle man, who was on his knees already, was driven to the floor by heavy fire coming out under pressure from the apartment door. He fell backwards and saw orange all around him. A tremendous amount of fire now had possession of the apartment doorway and the first floor hallway. Engine 55's control firefighter, Scott Konecki, had made it into the entrance hallway on the first floor, where he was donning his mask face piece. The amount of heat and energy coming out of the first floor apartment banked downwards and drove him to the front entrance door and stairway. The fire came out of the first floor apartment with a loud roar. Firefighter Erdman, Engine 55's nozzle man, operated the hose line from his back to try and cool the area above him where he was and in the hallway. He was able to recover and start operating his hose line through the apartment door. Back on the roof, Ladder 5's roof firefighter, Ed Donahue, called for the saw to the roof as the flames were burning through the skylight. The flames were reaching 10 to 15 feet above the roof. Still en route to the incident, Battalion 6, the 1075 chief, could now see the flames pushing over the roof from blocks away. Firefighter Chris Waugh and Firefighter Gerard Redmond, outside the building, went to the rear of 64 Watt Street to gain entry to the rear yards. Firefighter Waugh brought a saw to the roof as requested, and Redman ascended the rear fire escape of the fire building. He then vented the rear windows as well of the first floor and second floors, and made entry into the second floor. Fire was now filling the entire stairway, from the first floor to the second to the third, and through the scuttle and skylight. In 1947, led by Lieutenant Richard Sautner, Engine 55 advanced their hose line up the stairway to the second floor. Engine 24 also brought their hose line to the fire compartment on the first floor and advanced into the apartment itself. Battalion Chief Artisan, still in charge, ordered the ventilation team of Ladder 8, Dennis Grady, to raise a portable ladder and place it to the second floor windows. Deputy Chief Bruce Hassett of Division 1 then arrived at the scene. Battalion Chief Artisan briefed him of what had been transpired, including the urgent transmission that was heard, but was still unable to get clarification of the message. Now at 1948, Ladder 5's tiller man, Jerry Redman, climbed the rear fire escape to the second floor. He made entry into the rear of the apartment and worked towards the apartment door. He noticed that the door was dented inward and the fire was coming through the space between the door and the door jamb. It was later determined that Captain Drennan dented the fire door by trying to force it with his shoulder. Firefighter Redman had to use the halogen tool to force the door open due to it being dented inward. When he finally forced the door open, Captain Dremen fell into the apartment. Firefighter Seidenberg was lying next to his officer. The public hallway that they were now lying in was charged with thick smoke. Firefighter Redman transmitted a mayday message, and Deputy Chief Hassett ordered Battalion Chief Brian McCullough to get to the second floor to find out what was going on. Engine 55 kept advancing up the stairs, extinguishing the fire on the second floor. As they were advancing their hose line up the stairs, they found a severely burned body. They communicated that to Battalion 6 as they were climbing the stairway. They were obstructed by a mattress, which we heard in the introduction, and bed springs that were being stored in the hallway. They kept moving, all the way up to the third floor. Battalion Chief McCullough of 6th Battalion finally made it to the second floor as Engine 55 was advancing up to the third. Chief McCullough saw the severely burned body on the second floor. He transmitted a 1045 code 1, meaning a fatality. It wasn't readily apparent who the victim was, and then it was determined that the fatality was a firefighter. It was firefighter Jimmy Young. Battalion Chief McCullough called Deputy Chief Hassett and told him 
that the firefighter was a fatality and two firefighters were 1045, severely injured. A few minutes later, Deputy Chief Bruce Hassett of the 1st Division transmitted a second alarm and at 20.03, the first ambulance arrived, quickly followed by the second. The fire was placed under control at 2020. The aftermath. Firefighter James Young of Engine 24 died the day of the fire. Firefighter Chris Seidenberg of Engine 24 died the day after the fire. Both of these firefighters had their funerals on the same day. Captain John Brennan was transported to the burn centre where he was treated for third and fourth degree burns on his legs and his back. He would succumb to his injuries 40 days later. Captain Brennan and firefighters Seidenberg and Young were subjected to the intense heat of this fire for six and a half minutes. The fire burnt at temperatures over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The wire glass that was still remaining in the skylight over the stairway melted. Wire glass melts at over 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. In the fire report, it was determined that the unusual fire behaviour was a backdraft. The tightly enclosed occupancy with energy efficient windows contributed to this event. Also, lowered ceiling height contributed to the flash phenomenon. The fire was burning for over an hour before it was detected. Once the fire apartment door was forced open, the missing ingredient for a backdraft, air, was introduced. There were no warning signs indicating that a backdraft was possible. The fire came at the attacking firefighters with such a ferocity that it overwhelmed the capability of the first hose line. The fire coming out of the first floor apartment and racing up the stairs and venting over the roof extended for approximately 50 feet. It is interesting that in the fire report, the self-closing mechanism on the first floor apartment door did not function properly. And this has been a factor at fatal fires that winter in the Bronx. Alterations to this building reduced the size of the public hallway on the first floor and second floor. There was no second floor doorway to the second floor apartment due to the renovations. This second floor doorway could have been used as an area of refuge when operating on the floor above the fire. Storage of a mattress, box spring and a table further limited operating space in the hallway of the second floor. Firefighter James Young of Engine 24 was on FDNY for three years. He was 31 years old and was single. He was the son of a retired battalion chief, Harold Young. Two of James's brothers, Kenneth and Michael, were also in FDNY. Firefighter Chris Seidenberg of Engine 24 was on FDNY for just two years. He was 25 years old and was also single. Captain John Drennan was 49 years old and had done 26 years on the FDNY. He was married to his wife and had four children. The horrific losses at 62 Watt Street on March 28, 1994 would be the first of three unthinkable losses in a 13-year period for those assigned to Engine 24, Ladder 5 and Battalion 2. The second event was September the 11th, 2001 where 10 firefighters and fire officers would perish as they responded from the firehouse on West Houston Street and 6th Avenue. The third event was the loss of two firefighters, one from Engine 24 and one from Ladder 5, at the Deutsche Bank building fire on August 18th, 2007. There are members who were assigned to that firehouse for all three horrific events. That brings us to the end of today's debrief of 62 Watch Street, Manhattan, on March 28th, 1994. Our intention in bringing these debriefs to you is so that we can learn from the past and hopefully improve firefighter safety moving forwards. The Firefighters Podcast was created to recognize, acknowledge, inspire, and hopefully even motivate these incredible individuals who have chosen to be part of the first responder community. Our drive and purpose is to create a legacy resource for the current and future generations of firefighters and first responders. We get some incredible feedback from listeners and guests. And as the podcast grows, our desire to create longevity and sustainability means that we are asking for the support of our listeners. If you want to support the podcast, if you want to get discounts to our merchandise, hoodies, clothing, coins, patches, talent, and also access to all of the incredible documents get shared with us from our podcast guests and sector leaders. And please head over to our Patreon page and for just £3 a month, you can support the future of the podcast. Please finally hit that follow, subscribe or rate button on the platform you're listening. And wherever you are in the world, please support your emergency services responders. And thank you for listening.